from New York City, it's The Cube, covering Welcome to the New Edge. Brought to you by Pensando Systems. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with The Cube. We are high atop Goldman Sachs in downtown Manhattan. I think it's 43 floors for a really special event. It's the Pensando launch. It's really called Welcome to the New Edge. Um, and we talked about technology, we had some of the, the founders on, but these type of opportunities are really special to talk to some really senior leaders. And we're excited to have John Chambers back on, who as, as a you know, historic uh, CEO of Cisco for many, many years, has left that, is doing his own ventures, he's writing books, he's investing, and he happens to be chairman of the board of Pensando. So John, thanks for, uh, for taking a few minutes with us. Well, more than a few minutes. I think what we talked about today is a major industry change. And so to, to focus on that and uh, focus about the implications will be a lot of fun. So let's jump into it. So one of the things you led with earlier today was kind of these 10 year cycles. And you know, they're not exactly 10 years, but you outlined a series of them from mainframe, many client server, everybody knows kind of the sequence. What do you think it is about the 10 year kind of cycle? besides the fact that it's easy and convenient for us to remember, that, that kind of paces these big disruptions? Well, I think it, it has to do with once a company takes off, they tend to dominate that segment of the industry for so long that even if a creative idea came up, they were just overpowering. And then at toward the end of a 10-year cycle, they quit reinventing themselves. You know, we talked earlier about the uh, innovator's dilemma and the implications for it, or an architecture that was designed that suddenly can't go to the next level. So I think it's probably a combination of three or four different factors, uh, including the original incumbent who broke the class, disrupted others, not disrupting themselves. Right, but you also talked about a story where you had to shift focus uh, based on some, some customer feedback. And you ran Cisco for a lot longer than, mm -hmm. than 10 years. So how do you as a leader kind of keep your ears open to something that's a disruptive change? That's not your regular best customer and your regular best salesman asking for a little bit faster, a little bit cheaper, a little bit of more of the same versus the significant disruptive transformational shift. Well, this goes back to one of my most basic views in life is I think we learn more from our setbacks or setbacks we were part of or even the missteps or mistakes than you ever do your successes. Everybody loves to talk about successes, and I'm no different there. But when you watched a great state like West Virginia that was the chemical center of the world and the uh, uh, coal mining center of the world with 125,000 coal mines, six uh, miners, very well paid, uh, 6,000 of the top engineers in the world, it was the Silicon Valley of the uh, uh, chemical industry, and those just disappear. And because our state did not reinvent itself, because the education system didn't change, because we didn't distract, uh, attract a new set of businesses in, we just kept doing the right thing too long, we got left behind. Then I went to Boston. It was the Silicon Valley of the world. You know, uh, Route 128 around Boston was symbolic with the Silicon Valley and uh, at uh, 101 and, uh, and 280 around it. And we had the top university at that time, much like Stanford today, but MIT generating new companies. Uh, we had great companies, DEC, Wang, Data General, probably a million jobs in the area. And because we got stuck, in a segment of the market, quit listening to our customers and miss the transitions, not only did we lose probably 1.2 million jobs uh, uh, on it, 100,000 out of deck, 32,000 out of Wang, et cetera, uh, we did not catch the next generation of technology changes. So I understand the implications if you don't disrupt yourself. But I also learned uh, that if you're not regularly reinventing yourself, uh, you get left behind as a leader. And one of my toughest uh, competitors came up to me and said, John, I, I love the way you're reinventing uh, Cisco and uh, how you've done that multiple times. And then I turned and I said, that's why a CEO has got to be in the job for more than uh, four or five years. And he said, now we disagree again, which we <laughs> usually did. Uh, and he said, most people can't reinvent themselves. And he said, I'm an example. I'm a a pretty good CEO, he's actually a very good CEO, but he said, after I've been there three or four years, I've made the changes that I know, I've got to go somewhere else. And he could see I didn't buy in, and then he said, how many of your top 100 people you've been happy with once they've been in the job for more than five years? I hesitate, and I said, only one. 
And he's right. You've got to move people around. You've got to get people comfortable with disruption on it. And the hardest one to disrupt are the companies or the leaders who have been most successful. And yet that's when you've got to think about disruption. Right. So to pivot on that a little bit in terms of, of kind of the government's role and in, in, in jobs specifically, yes. we're in this really strange period of time. We have record low unemployment, right? Tiny, tiny unemployment. And yet we see automation coming in aggressively with autonomous vehicles and this and that. And just to pick truck drivers as a category, everyone can clearly see that autonomous vehicles are going to knock them out in the not too distant future. That said, there's more demand for truck drivers today than there's ever been. And they can't fill the position. So from a, the with this weird thing where we're going to have a bunch of new jobs that are created by technology, we're going to have a bunch of old jobs that get displaced by technology, but those people aren't necessarily the same people that can leave the one and go to the other. So as you look at that challenge, I know you work with a lot of, of government leaders, yeah. how should they be thinking about, about taking on this challenge? Well, I think you've got to take it on very squarely. And let's use the U.S. as an example, and then I'll parallel what France is doing and what India is doing that is actually much more creative than what we are from countries you wouldn't have anticipated. Uh, in the U.S., we know that 50% of the Fortune 500 will probably not exist in 10 years, 12 at the most. Uh, we know that the large companies will not incrementally hire people over this next decade, and they've often been the, one of the best sources of hiring because of AI and automation will change that. So it's not just a question of being skilled in one area and move to another. Those jobs will disappear within the companies. If we don't have new jobs in startups, and if we don't have the startups running at about three to four times the current volumes, we've got a real problem looking out five to ten years. And the startups, where everybody thinks we're doing a good job, the IPOs are a third to a half of what they were two decades ago. And so if you need 25 million jobs over this next decade, and your startups are at a level more like they were in the 90s, uh, uh, that's going to be a challenge. And so I think we've got to think from a government perspective of how we become a startup nation again, how we think about long-term job creation, how we think about job creation, not taking one money out of one pocket and give it to another. People want a real job. They want to have a meaningful job. we got to change our K-12 through education system, which is broken. We've got to change our university system to generate the jobs for where people are going. And then we've got to retrain people. That is very doable if you go at it with a total plan and approach it from a scale perspective. That was lacking. And one of the disappointing things uh, in the debate last night, and while I'm a Republican, I really want who's going to really lead us well, <coughs> both at the presidential level but also in the Senate and the House, is there was a complete lack of any vision on what the country should look like 10 years from now and how we're going to create 25 million jobs and how we're going to create 10 million more that are going to be displaced and how we're going to re-educate people for it. Uh, it was a lot of finger pointing and transactional, but no overall plan. Modi did the reverse in India and actually Macron in all places in France where they looked at GDP growth, job creation, startups, education changes, et cetera, and they executed to an overall approach. So uh, I'm looking for our government really to change the approach and to really say how are we going to generate jobs and how are we going to deal with the issues that are coming at us. And it's a combination of all the above. Yeah. Let's shift gears a little bit about, yeah. about the education system. And, and you're very involved, and you talked about MIT. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, I think Stanford and Cal are such big drivers of innovation in the Bay Area because smart people go there and they don't leave. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a lot of good buzz now happening in Atlanta as an investment, really piggybacking on Georgia Tech, which also creates a lot of great mm -hmm. engineers. You know, as you look at education, I don't want to go through K-12, through but more higher education, how do you see that evolving mm -hmm. in today's world? It's super expensive. There's tremendous debt it's for the kids coming out. It doesn't necessarily train them for the new jobs, the jobs how, do, how do you see kind of the role of higher education and that evolving into kind of this new world in which we're headed? Well, the good news and bad news about when I look at successful startups around the world, they're always centered around a innovative university. And it isn't just about the raw horsepower of the kids. It starts with the CEO of the university, the president of the university, uh, their curriculum, their entrepreneurial approach. Do they knock down the barriers across the various groups from engineering to business to law, et cetera? And are they thinking out of box? And if you watch, there is a huge missing piece between 
Georgia Tech more of an exception, but still not running at the level they need to. And the Northeast around Boston and New York and Silicon Valley, the rest of the country is being left behind. So I'm looking for universities to completely redo their curriculum. I'm looking for it really breaking down the silos within the groups and focusing on outcomes. And much like Steve Case has done a very good job on focusing about the Rust Belt and how do you do startups, I'm going to learn from what I saw in France at Polytechnique and the IITs in India and what occurred in Stanford and MIT used to occur is you've got to get the universities to be the core. That's where the kids want to stay close to, and we've got to generate a whole different curriculum, if you will, in the universities, including continuous learning for their graduates to be able to come back virtually and say, how do I learn about reskilling myself? Yeah. I think the, the current model is just not, it's just not the it's right broken. model for K the, through 12 for is hopelessly forward. broken. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the universities, while we're still better than anywhere else in the world, we're still teaching. And some of the teachers and some of the books are what I could have used in college. Right. right. So we got to rethink the whole <laughs> curriculum. John Disrupt. Chambers on the inside. Disrupt. So shifting gears a little bit, you've played with lots of companies in your CEO role. You guys did a ton of M&A. You're very, very famous for uh, the successful M&A that you did mm -hmm. over a number of years. But in an investor role, J2 now, you're looking at a more early stage. And you said you made a number of investments, yeah. which is exciting. So mm -hmm. as you evaluate opportunities, A, in teams that come to pitch to you, yep. B, what are the key things you look for? Go okay, in the sequence you raised them. Uh, first, in the, my prior world, I was really happy to do 180 acquisitions. Uh, in my current world, I'm reversed. I want them to go IPO because you add 76% of your headcount after an IPO or after you become a unicorn. When companies are bought, including what I bought in my prior role, their headcount growth was pretty well done. Uh, we'd add engineers after that, but we'd blow them through our sales channels, services, finance, et cetera. So I want to see many more of these companies go public, and this goes back to a national agenda about getting IPOs, not back to where they were during the 90s when it was almost two to three times what you've seen over the last decade, uh, but probably double even that number of the 90s to generate the jobs we want. So I'm very interested now about companies going public in direction. To the second part of your question on what do I look for in startups and why, if I can bridge it, to am I so fared up about Pensano? Uh, if I look for my startups and it's like I do acquisitions, I develop a playbook. I run that playbook faster and faster. It's how I do digitization of countries, et cetera. And so for a area that I'm going to invest in and bet on, first thing I look at is their market technology transition and business model transition occurring at the same time. In other words, Amazon of 15 years ago is an example. Uh, the second thing I look at is the CEO and ideally the whole founding team, but it's usually just the CEO. The third thing I look for is what do the customers really say about them. There's only one Steve Jobs, and uh, it took him seven years. So I go to the customers and say, what do you really think of this company? Fourth thing I look for is how close to an inflection point are they? The fifth thing I look for uh, is uh, what they have in their ecosystem. Are they partnering, things of that type? So if I were to look at Pensano, which is really the topic about can they bring to the market the new edge in a way that will be – a market leading force for a whole decade through an ecosystem of partners that will change business dramatically and perhaps become the next major tech icon. Uh, it's how will you do that. Their, their vision in terms of market transitions and business transitions are 100% right. We've talked about it, 5G, uh, IoT, Internet of Things going from you know, 15 billion devices to 500 billion devices in probably seven years. And with the movement to the edge, the business models will also change. And this is where democratization of the cloud and people are able to share that power, where every technology company becomes a business, uh, becomes a, uh, every business company becomes a technology company. Right. The other thing I look at is the team. This is a team of six people myself being a part of it that thinks like one. That is so unusual. If you're lucky, you get a CEO and maybe a founder or co-founder. This team, you've got six people who've worked together for over 20 years who think alike. The customers, you heard the discussions today. Right. And we've not talked to a single uh, cloud player, a single enterprise company, a single service provider or major technology company who doesn't say, 
this is very unique. Let's talk about how we work together on it. And the inflection point, it's now. You saw that today. Nobody, yeah. nobody told them it's young man's game, obviously. They, they got the 20-something mixed up. Uh, no, actually, we're <laughs> redefining 20-something. But it does say uh, age is more perspective on how you think. Right, right. And Shimon Perez, who uh, passed away, unfortunately, two years ago, was a very good friend. He basically said, you've got to all your life think like a teenager and to really think and dream out of box. And he did it remarkably well. So I think leaders, whether they're 20 something or 20 some years of experience of working together, you gotta think that right. way. So I'm curious your take on, on, okay. on how this has evolved because you know there was data and there was compute and networking brought those two things together and, and you were at the heart of that. Mm -hmm. Now it's getting so much more complex with edge to get your take on edge, but also more importantly, this exponential growth. You talked about going from however many millions of devices that were connected mm. to the billions of devices that are connected now. How do you stay, how do you help yourself think along exponential curves? Because that is not easy and it's not human, but you have to if you're gonna try to get ahead of that next wave. Completely agree. Uh, and this is not just for me, how do I do it? I'm sharing it more that other people can learn and think about it perhaps the same way. The first thing is, it's always good to think of the positive. You can change the world, here are the positive things, but I've also seen the negatives we talked about earlier. If you don't think that way, if you don't think that way as a leader of your company, leader of your country, or the leader of a venture group, uh, you're gonna get left behind, and the implications for it are really bad. The second is you've got to say, how do you catch and get a replicatable playbook? The neat thing about what we're talking about, whether it's by country in France or India or the US, we've got replicatable playbooks, we know what to run. Uh, the third element is you've got to have the courage to get outside your comfort zone. And I love change when it happens to you. I don't like it when it happens to me, and I know that. So I've got to get people around me who push me outside my comfort zone on that. And then you've got to be able to dream and, and think like that teenager we talked about before. But that's what we were just with a group of customers uh, who were at this event. And they were asking, how do we get this innovation into our company? How do we get the ability to innovate through not just strategic partnerships with other large companies or partnerships with startups, but how do we build that internally? It comes down to the leader has to create that image and that approach. Right. Modi's done it for 1.3 billion people in India, a vision of the future on GDP growth, a digital country, startups, et cetera. If they can do it for 1.3 billion, tell me why the U.S. cannot do it <laughs> and why even small states here can't yeah. do it. Shifting gears a little bit, right. a lot of black eyes in Silicon Valley right now. It's a lot of negativity going on, a lot of problems with, with privacy and the trading data for currency. And, you know, there's, it's a, been a rough, a rough uh, road. You're way into tech for good. And, and as you said, you know, you can, you can use the technology for good, you can use technology for bad. Mm -hmm. What are some things you are doing on, on the tech for good side? Because I don't think it gets the spotlight um, mm -hmm. that it probably should because it, you know, it doesn't sell papers. Well, uh, actually, the press has been pretty good. We just need to do it more on scale. Uh, going back to the Cisco days, we never had any major issues with governments, even though there was a Snowden issue. Uh, there were a lot of implications about the power of the Internet uh, because we work with governments and citizens to say what are the legitimate needs uh, so that everybody benefits from this. And where the things that we might have considered doing that uh, governments felt strongly about or the citizens wouldn't prosper from, we just didn't do it. Uh, and uh, we work with Democrats and Republicans alike. And 90% of our nation believed tech was for good. But we worked hard on that. And today, I think you've got to have more companies doing this. And then uh, what we're doing uniquely in JC2 is we're literally partnering with France on Tech is for Good, and I'm Macron's uh, global tech ambassador, and we focus about job creation and inclusive, not just in Paris or around Station F, uh, but throughout all of the various regions in the country. Same thing within India, across 26 different states, with Modi on how do you drive it through. And then if we can do it in France or India, why can't we do it in each state in the U.S., partnering with West Virginia with a very creative uh, president of the university there, West Virginia University, with the Democrats and Republicans in their national Senate, uh, but also within the uh, governor and the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate within West Virginia, and really saying we're going to change it together. And getting a model that you can then cook 
you cut across the U.S. if you change the curriculum to your earlier comments, if you begin to focus on outcomes, not being an expert in one area, which is liable not to have a job right. 10 years later. So I'm a dreamer within that, but I think you owe an obligation to giving back, and I think they're all within our grasp. Right. And I think you can do the both together. I think at JC2, we can create a billion-dollar company with less than 10 people. I, I think you can change the world and also make a very good profit. And I think technology companies have to get back to that. You've got to create more jobs than you destroy. And you can't be destroying jobs and then telling other people how to live their lives and what their politics should be. Yeah. That just doesn't work in terms of the environment. Well, John, again, thanks for your time. I'll give you a last word on, sure. on kind of what happened here today. I mean, you're here. Antonio Neri was here. We we're at the headquarters of Goldman, a, a, a flagship launch customer. Um, for the people that weren't here today, why should they be paying attention? Well, if we've got this market transition right, both technology and business model, the next transition will be everything goes to the edge. And as every company or every government or every person has to be both good in their, quote, area of expertise or their vertical they're in, they've got to also be good in technology. What happened today was a leveling of the playing field as it relates to cloud uh, in terms of everyone should have choice, democratization there, but also an architecture that allows people to really change their business models uh, as everything moves to the edge where 75% of all transactions, all data will be had, and it might even be higher than that. Secondly, you saw an historic first. Never has anybody ever emerged from stealth after only two and a half years of existing as a company with this type of powerhouse behind them. And you saw the players where you have a customer, Goldman Sachs, in one of the most leading edge areas of industry change, which is obviously finance, uh, leading as the customer who's driven our direction from the very beginning. And a company like NetApp that understood the implication on storage from two and a half years ago and drove our direction from the very beginning. A company like HP Enterprises, who understood this could go across their whole company in terms of the implications and the unique opportunity to really change and focus on how do they evolve their company to provide their customer experience in a very unique way. How do you really begin to think about Equinex in terms of how they uh, changed entirely from a service provider perspective what they have to do in terms of the direction and capability. And then Lightspeed, one of the most creative venture capital that really understands this transition, saying I want to be a part of this, including being on the board and changing the world one more time. So what happened today? If we're right, I think this was the beginning of a major inflection point as everything moves to the edge and how a ecosystem players with Pensano at the heart of that ecosystem uh, can take on the giants, but also really use this technology to give everybody choice in how they really make a difference in the future, as well as perhaps give back to society. Love it. Thanks, John. My pleasure. That was Appreciate fun. It. He's John. I'm Jeff. You're watching The Cube. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.